Take your Bible, turn to Galatians chapter 3. Let's get right into the lesson this morning. Got a lot on my mind. Galatians chapter 3, verse 1. Uh, o foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you, that you should not obey the truth, before whose eyes Jesus Christ have been evidently set forth, crucified among you. The cross, the cross is the core of God's grace. How God's grace works in your life is centered around the cross. Everything in your Bible, Old Testament, New Testament, is centered around the cross. And that's why Paul puts these two ideas together. Evidently set forth, crucified among you, and then he says, Be who bewitched you? Who brought in law-keeping or some form of rituals? Who brought these things into you and who turned you away from what Christ did? Christ did it all. If you think that God is expecting you to do something to merit his favor in your life, you're wrong. You've been told wrong. He's not, he doesn't expect it from you. Once you're saved, however, God does work through you to fulfill his will. I, I'm not denying that at all. I'm not saying we just lay around big lumps and God saves us. But it's his work through us and not ourselves. It never is because once it is, we boast on it. We always, if, we, if we're doing something... And we see somebody not doing what we're doing. We boast about, we boast over them saying, look at what I'm doing. Or I, look at what I'm not doing and look at what they're doing. That's exactly what we do. And it's never about that. It's about Christ crucified and his grace. Now, I, um, we, we went through a lot and I'm, I've got, still got a lot to show you on this witchcraft deal. Uh, we left off with this last Sunday morning about how witchcraft is moving into the church. Sometimes it's in more subtle forms. This right here, I mean, once I take a look at this, I'm going, this is witchcraft. I mean, it's that simple. Some people, though, they're so deceived and their minds have no discernment whatsoever. They accept this. Oh, really? Harry Potter? Well, he's a good thing. He's a good guy. He's on the side of good. And he's using magic and witchcraft and wizardry for, and, it, and he's a picture of Christ. And it's Christ's power. This, this is nonsense, people. Absolute, total nonsense. Witchcraft, through and through. Uh, the gospel, according to Harry Potter. That is... If any man preach any other gospel, let him be accursed. That's what Paul said. First thing out of his mouth in the Galatians. If anybody preaches any other gospel. So if somebody comes in with a Harry Potter, gospel according to Harry Potter, it's cursed. Got a curse on it. Looking for God in Harry Potter. And, the, and people buy this stuff. Now, let me, let, me, let me set your mind, let me tell you why all this stuff happens. The, the devil always works from the top down. Linking all the churches in, feeding. Let me explain it like this. We are an independent, Bible-believing church, not under anybody here, except the Bible. We don't answer to a denomination. We don't answer to a collective. There's no pope over us telling us what we can and cannot do. We, we don't get stuff force-fed to us from a denomination or from some group that tells us what we have to teach every Sunday and what we have to preach every Sunday. I don't buy sermons off the internet, pre-written from somebody else that I don't know. Okay? That's, that's, that's wrong. God is, God is the supreme authority over our church. So here's what happens. They start getting in the top tiers of the denominations and the publishing houses. Christian publishing groups. They start working in at those top levels, writing the books, writing the lessons, Writing the Sunday school literature, writing the vacation Bible school stuff, writing the, the young adult Bible lessons, writing the small group lessons, writing the teaching books. They start working in. That gets fed down through the bookstores, through the denominations, into the churches. And now God is not the authority in that church. Satan is. To me, it's that simple. That's, how, that's what Jude told us. 
He said, certain men crept in unawares. Paul said, after I leave, grievous wolves are going to be in among you. Okay? So this, this is how this stuff gets fed into the churches. It's, and it starts with pastors who have no discernment, who will read this stuff, think this is some, oh boy, if I could get, maybe this is something new I could bring into my church. They have no discernment. You got pastors doing this. You got youth pastors doing this. Getting the teens away, getting the children and the teens away from the main church so that they'll teach them whatever they want to teach them. The gospel according to Tolkien. He was the one who wrote the Lord of the Rings. Here, here again, another gospel. The, uh, finding God in the Lord of the Rings. Lord of the Rings was about a, a wizard named Gandalf. Get this. Who fought a beast down in, the, down in the heart of the earth. Was killed. Was reborn. And he, he was Gandalf the Grey. Now he's been resurrected. Now he's Gandalf the White. And he has more power than he ever had. That is not Jesus Christ. That's not a picture of Christ. It is a picture of Antichrist. He's a wizard. He is using demonic, spiritual, satanic powers... To fight, you know, whatever's going on. I read the books a long time ago in high school and sort of got into that for a while and God pulled me out. I said, Mike, that's not for you. Uh, Twilight, another series of books about vampires and werewolves and about a vampire falling in love with a girl or a wolf. Or think, I mean, think about the terms here. Okay, the gospel, again, another gospel according to Twilight. Parables from Twilight, a Bible study. And not, notice, uh, get me all worked up here, drop my pen. Got me all messed up. Notice this. The Twilight, stop it. The gospel according to Twilight, women, sex, and God. That is witchcraft. Boom. Okay. Leviticus 19.31 Regard not them that have familiar spirits. A familiar spirit poses as maybe some dead person or an ascended master or the Holy Ghost. A familiar spirit will pose as the Holy Ghost. Regard not them that have familiar spirits. Neither seek after wizards. To be defiled by them. God said, if you bring that in, you've defiled my house. I'm, I'm the Lord your God. And here's, here's what he's saying here. And this God reminds me of this all the time. Mike, you have a God. And what that means to me is, I have someone who stands for me, someone who fights for me, someone who defends me. Someone who protects me, someone who does for me what I cannot do, someone I can take my problems to, someone who forgives my sins. I have a God. I have the most powerful God anywhere. And I use my God to help me in my life. Why would I seek after lesser gods? Because that's what you're doing. To be defiled by them. I'm the Lord your God. Leviticus 20, verse 6. And the soul that turneth after such as have familiar spirits and after wizards to go a whoring after them. Let me look, look back at, that, at the title of that book. Women, Sex, and God. To go a whoring after them. God was, this Bible's right when it identifies and connects witchcraft, sorcery, wizardry, and fornication. Because there are rituals that are done in lots of religions that involve male and female. The actual act being done and performed in order to get psychic power, in order to get spiritual power, in order to get illumination. It's crazy. Deuteronomy 18. Did I read all that? No, to go a whoring after them. I will even set my face against that soul and will cut him off from among his people. Remember when I preached about cancer? God said, cut it off. God said, people that do this, I'm going to cut them off from my people. 
I'm going to separate my people from that person. That's what God did with Achan because of what he had taken from Babylon. God cut him off from his people. That's what God had, had done with um, Korah when he gainsayed and, and rebelled against Moses' authority. God cut him and 250 people swallowed up in the earth just like that. Boom, gone. Whole families devoured just like that. God cut them off and separated them, separated his people. When people saw that, they said, we're on the Lord's side. We're for Jesus. Okay? Yeah, I mean, it scared them. And God did that on purpose. And I want to tell you something. That's the same God works today. Do not be surprised when you see somebody and their life just explodes and God cuts them off from, a, from his people. Do not be surprised when you see that. That is God showing you, this is what I'm going to do to sinners. This is what I'm going to do to people who don't act the way I want them to act and do what I tell them to do. This is, this is what I do to people who go a whoring after other things. Okay, God still does it. Deuteronomy 18. God said, and there's a whole list of things in Deuteronomy 18. There's um, nine, I mentioned this, nine abominable works. Those are the opposites of the nine fruits of the Spirit. But in verse 11, he says, a charmer. So there was a TV show called Charmed. Anybody remember that? What was it about? Three witches. Okay. And they had a book of shadows with a triquetra on it. A book of shadows is a book where witches write down their spells, their rituals, their things like that. Charmer or a consulter with familiar spirits. So any spirit that is not the Holy Spirit, any spirit that masquerades as the Holy Spirit or whatever, that anybody who consults to those spirits, a wizard, God said, cut them off. Necromancer, someone who practices contact with the dead or uses dead people for their power. For all that do these things are an abomination unto the Lord. And because of these abominations, the Lord thy God does drive them out from before thee. God said, I will not have it in my house. And any place that has that, I'm going to cut them off. God will write Ichabod over a church who does those things and the glory has departed from that church meaning God's spirit is not there now in the void of God's spirit there must be a replacement so that's when they start bringing in the familiar spirits and the wizards and the witchcraft and all this stuff there is even attached to the Bethel Church at Redding California as one of their ministerial staff Someone who is a consulter with familiar spirits. It's on their staff. I'm not kidding you. Crazy. Witchcraft stuff. Um, now, here is another form of witchcraft. Witchcraft in ritualism. We do not have any, in our Bibles, we do not have any prescribed rituals there is nothing in this Bible that tells us now in your service you must do this and you must say these words and you must then perform this and then you have to do it this way there is there's nothing in our Bible says that okay even the model prayer that Jesus gave, when the Lord teaches how to pray, he said, pray in this manner. He did, he did not say pray these words. He said, pray in this manner. Do you remember, a guy wrote a book. I'm, I'm trying to bring it to mind here. The, what was it, Prayer of Jabez? Remember that? What, what, what was the name of that book? The Prayer of Jabez. This guy says, I prayed this prayer Three times a day, five times a day, whatever. Every day, and God has made me rich. God has made me healthy. God has made me successful. And I have big business and I have a lot of money in the bank and I have a beautiful wife. And I've got, I've got all this stuff because I do this thing every day, four or five times a day. And if you do this, then God will give you all these things. That is witchcraft. God did not say, pray this prayer. Pray after this manner. Learn, learn what... 
Here's what Jesus' mind is. He starts out, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. You start out worshiping God first. That God is first in your prayers. Okay? Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. You start extolling and praising God. Then you give Him. Give us this day our daily bread. Then you start with the supplications. And forgive us of our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not. And He said, pray in that manner. Not pray those words. No rituals in this. The Catholic Church and other churches like it are all about. They have a book full of. All right. Now say these words. Put your hands up in the air like this. Make the sign of the cross. Have you ever watched a Roman Catholic mass? The wafer to them is God. I, w I went to one Funeral, Catholic funeral, and I watched this. He's got this card, cardstock, that he lays down, and when he prays the prayer over the host, he pre he reads these, re he recites these words written out, prescribed for him. And if he breaks that bread, whatever falls on that card is still the body of Jesus and it must be dealt with in a certain way. He then will take and empty it into the cup so that the body of Jesus is not wasted. That's, that's, rich, that's witchcraft. You must say these words, you must pray this prayer, and if you do this, then you will magically transform this wafer into the body of Christ. The word hocus pocus. The phrase hocus pocus. Uh, you remember, um, I forgot his name, I had him preaching here during our Bible conference. Can't, I, friend, best friend of mine, can't remember his name. Anyway, he said the phrase hocus pocus comes from the, the Latin where they invoke the magic power to transform the wafer into the body of Christ. In hoc est something. But that's where the phrase hocus pocus comes from. It's, it's all witchcraft. Okay? Even, even the closest that we ever come here in this church to any sacred service is when we have communion. And even at that, there is not a ritual for me to recite in the Bible to direct that service. There are several scriptures that I use. There are things that we do. But nothing in that makes the wafer or the, or the fruit of the vine any more. Ha, nothing gives it power. Nothing makes it effective. It is, a, it is us following Christ, communing with His sacrifice. That's all it is. John 4, 23. But the hour cometh and now is when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship Him. Your flesh is not required to worship God with. So then, in saying that, if I say these words and hold my... And I've watched these guys. They'll hold their hands like this. Why do they do that? Because they're told that's part of the ritual. Then you must make the sign of the cross. Then you must do this. Then you must... And it's all ritualism. Galatians 5.20, notice that he, lo he, in he introduced idolatry and witchcraft together. That's the Catholic Church. And any other church that has a statue in it of any biblical figure where they turn and pray to it. I've told you about going to a Lutheran church funeral. And they got a big statue of Jesus up on the stage. And I'm just going, oh, well, okay, you know, maybe that's just whatever. So the, the, the Lutheran priest comes in from the back of the church reading this prayer out of a book. And I'm going, well, okay, you know, it's just, that's the way they do it. Then he goes up on stage and he's reading the prayer to the statue. And I'm going, nope, sorry. Not supposed to do that. And God put idolatry and witchcraft right next to each other. Because idols always require rituals. To be said in their presence. Always. Perry Stone comes out and I watched an episode of his show where he was introducing this thing called The Meal That Heals. And here's what he said. He said, I take communion every day. And because I do that, God then heals my body of all diseases. That's 
witchcraft. It's ritualism. He, he has in here the forward to this book. And look at what he says. Enjoying intimate daily communion with God. The, for, the man who wrote the forward to his book, Jen Tezen Franklin. Let me tell you who this guy is. He wrote a book called Fasting. Opening the door to a deeper, more intimate, more powerful relationship with God. Now, you show me in your Bible where fasting gives you intimacy with God. You show that to me in the scriptures. Fasting has a place and it has a purpose. But this guy, what there's, he wrote a book called Fasting to Regain Your Edge. Recover your passion, reclaim your purpose, restore your joy. And it's all about performing these rituals. Did you know that Buddhist and Hindus and witches fast. New Agers fast. They say they must purge the body of all toxins. And again, it's about the body must be in a right place so that the spirits can come. It's, and God said, leave your flesh out of it. You do not worship me in the flesh. I'll reject it every time. Worship me in spirit and in truth. Um... Rituals like slain in the spirit. That's witchcraft. Pure and simple. Um, praying over prayer claws. Nonsense. Nonsense. They'll send you a prayer cloth and they'll say, Oral Roberts has prayed directly over these prayer cloths. And if you would take this prayer cloth and lay it on your pillow at night, or if you'll put this in your wallet, or if you'll lay it on the part of your body that God will heal the disease. That's not what God said. That's not what God said. A new point of contact for the healing of cancer, incurable diseases, and impossible situations. Richard Roberts. That's Oral's son. Which? This was written by the guy who got busted for driving under the influence of alcohol. He left his prayer cloth at home. And he went out and got drunk. Teachings that tell you if you worship in a certain way or enough times that God will give you some impartation. It is works-based grace. It is saying that if you do this enough. And I started hearing this years ago. About you must worship God. You must really, you must get in, you intimate with God. If you worship God, worship God. And I, listen, I believe you ought to worship God. But you've heard me say it a million times. I'm not serving him to get him to do something for me. He's already done it. His promises to me and the things that God has done in my life, he did not do it because I performed a ritual or I fasted or I did this or I did that. In fact, it was while I was a sinner that God did those things for me. The circle maker. This guy goes into Jewish mysticism he goes into jewish traditions finds a story about a man there was a there was a famine in the land it had not rained so this holy man a jewish mystic drew a circle in the ground stood in the circle and he said i'm not moving out of the circle until it rains so this guy wrote a book called Circle Maker. And he said, and he's got everybody drawing circles. He said, draw the circle, get inside the circle, and then you pray, and then God will hear your prayer. That's witchcraft. Do you know why? Witches perform their rituals. They must draw a circle. It is called the witch's circle. This did not come from the, show me in your Bible where God said, draw a circle, get in it, and I will hear your prayer. If God didn't say do it, don't do it. Okay? Here's, here's part of the witchcraft ritual. First, consecrate your element. I, I don't know if I'm going to read all this. This is witchcraft. Let me move through some of this. Law of attraction is pure witchcraft. It says if you think positive thoughts, then positive things will come to you. If you think positive thoughts and say positive words, then you will attract the universe will give you positive things. So the law of attraction, it's in books, it's in thoughts become things. Use the law of attraction to create the life you desire. That's pure witchcraft. So then here is Norman Vincent Peale, The Power of Positive Thinking. Witchcraft. 
If you think positive, you will say positive, and then you will get positive. Robert Schuller, if you can dream it, you can do it. Power thoughts. Achieve your potential through power thinking. That is witchcraft. Joyce Meyer, power thoughts. Same thing. Same thing. In fact, Joyce Myers, me and my big mouth, your answer is right under your nose. Battlefield of the mind. She writes books about what you think and what you say. And if you think and say negative things, then you will have negative things coming to you. But if you think and say positive things, then you will have positive things come to you. She says, I am rich. She said this in a TV interview. I am rich because I deserve to be. Because I did what God said. That's why God has made me wealthy. This is why I have a private jet. This is why I have three houses. This is why I have more money than everybody else. This is why I'm world famous. Because I obeyed God and did what God said. She's a, and by the way, she was a practicing witch before she got into the ministry. Here's another book. The Secret Power of Speaking God's Word. She says, if you say these words, then God will do it. Joel Osteen, with your best life now, seven steps to living your full potential. He says, if you will transform your mind, God will transform your life. Our thoughts contain tremendous power. You don't even know what to ask or think in your prayers, God said. These guys are lying and they're witches. Become a better you. Seven keys to improving your everyday life. Turn to Isaiah chapter 3 verse 10. Turn your Bible to Isaiah 3.10 in a King James Bible. King James, authorized, 1611, Bible. Isaiah 3.10. Man, I get worked up over this stuff. Isaiah 3.10. Say ye to the righteous, that it shall be well with them, for they shall eat the fruit of their doings. That's what the Bible says. Say ye to the righteous, that it shall be well with him, for they shall eat the fruit of their doings. Now, here's what Joel Osteen said. I have it up on the screen. He says, one of the best ways that we can improve our self-image is with our words. Words are like seeds. They have creative power. That is witchcraft. He, Joyce, they all teach that if you speak positive words, then they will create what you have spoken. That is witchcraft. It says in Isaiah that we will eat the fruit of our words. No, it does not. That is a lie. He lied about what God said. He retranslated. He got it from another Bible. Got it from the Amplified. Retranslated it or whatever. But he, he did not like the King James. So he went to a different translation that says what he wanted it to say. He said, that's amazing when you stop to consider that truth. Our words tend to produce what we're saying. Every day we should make positive declarations over our lives. We should say things such as, I'm blessed, I'm prosperous, I'm healthy, I'm talented, I'm creative, I'm wise. What if you don't have any money? What if you're broke? You're in debt? The collectors are calling? They're harassing your work? Can you say, I am prosperous? That's a lie. He is telling you to lie. If you, here's poor Gloria. Good to be back, Gloria. In the hospital. What's wrong with you, Gloria? I need a pacemaker. According to Joel, she created with her words the issue that she had to have a pacemaker because she said it. You know what she did? She told the truth. She did not even know she had an issue with her heart. It was by God's grace that they even found it and knew she needed a pacemaker. I'm telling you people, stay away from these people. Stay, if they're your Facebook friends, cut them off. They will influence you. They will teach you false doctrine. They're practicing witchcraft. They don't even realize it, but that's what they've been fed. If, you're, if you are not wealthy do not go around saying i'm wealthy it's a lie if you're not healthy do not go around saying i'm healthy i'm healed i'm proclaiming my health i i i have no disease that see you're lying is it not better when you're sick to go to god and say god will you will you heal me 
Is it not just easier to say, God, help me? Because if I'm sick, let me tell you something. Some of the greatest times I've ever had was when I was sick as a dog. Because then God's helping you. I was laid over here with pneumonia in the ER one night. Sick as a dog. And there was two late. The ER was full. They put in two other women in the same room. They drew a curtain. And I heard them over there crying. And I said, ma'am, <coughs> can I pray for you guys? And they started bawling. They said, yeah. So I out loud, I just started praying for them. And they said, thank you. I don't know who you are, but thank you. And I'll tell you. It was not me at my best. It was me at my worst. Don't fall for this trap. It is, they'll tell you that if you're not doing enough works, God will not bless you, and that is a lie. We have come into this place as sinners in need of God's mercy and grace. Not as superior beings who deserve God's grace. That's a lie. Here's one of the principles of Wicca. We conceive of the greater power or the creative power in the universe as manifesting through polarity, as masculine and feminine. They're saying that God is male and female and that this same creative power lies in all people and functions through the interaction of the masculine and the feminine. Remember what I said about fornication. We neither value above the other, knowing each to be supportive of the other. We value sex as pleasure, as the symbol and embodiment of life, and as one of the sources of energy used in magical practice and religious worship. And that is exactly what we read a while ago with that book introducing God, sex, women, another gospel. God, the Bible said they would turn the grace of God into lasciviousness. That is exactly what they've done. When you, have, when you have pastors putting billboards up in major cities, advertising, showing two people in bed together, saying, we will talk about sex for the next four Sundays, come to our church. They are going after the lascivious minds of people, teaching them that, and Ed, what's his last name? Ed something junior, a preacher down in Houston, big mega church, actually said sex is worship actually said it on the stage during his sermon well i'm going to skip that the message bible this is quoting genesis chapter one where it says god said let us make man in our image after our likeness let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over cattle earth and over every creepy thing. So God created man in his own image. The image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. God created. This is what the message Bible says. God created human beings. He created them godlike, Reflecting God's nature. He created them male and female. That is a lie. It is telling mortal man. That God already created you. Godlike. That is a huge difference. Between saying in his image. And his likeness. Yes. We have a head. We have two arms. Two legs. We have hands and feet. And so does God. God did not make us after monkeys. Praying mantises. Wolves. Sheep. He did not make us. In, he made us in the image that he is. But to say. To say. That man is godlike. Is an abomination. Because see that's. That's what all this new age and all this, all this, the, the, the religions now are all saying, all of us have God in us. Why don't we just put aside our differences and become one? Which is what the Antichrist is going to do. Kenneth Copeland said people have even argued about whether god is male or female but the bible itself tells us that he's both he's lying through his false teeth 
That's right. In the Hebrew language, all words have gender. See, this, this is what they do. They, don't, they read the King James. They don't find what they want in there. So they go, I'm going to retranslate it. All words have gender. They're either male or female. But the Hebrew word Jehovah is both masculine and feminine. He, there is no way in the world he can know that. There is nothing like the name Jehovah anywhere in the Hebrew Bible. Nothing like it. He is as much female as he is male and as much male as he is female. And then he said, originally mankind was that way too. When God first made man, he was as much female as he was male. There's this theory, Kenneth Copeland believes it, and other people, Rick Warren teaches it. That's what this is. Rick Warren said, God created them both male and female. He, Rick Warren is teaching that God is both male and female and that Adam was originally a male female. He was an androgynous being. Okay. So Copeland says, uh, then God separated the female part out of the, out of the male and made woman or the man with the womb. That's what he says woman means. He's just an idiot. After that, man and woman had to come together to be perfectly whole. This is from his book, From Faith to Faith by Kenneth and Gloria Copeland. Witchcraft. It is witchcraft. The God of witchcraft is the horned God, Sir Nunos. He is an androgynous. They worship two gods, the male God and the female God. And when they come together as one, they worship them as the whole multi-gendered God. Do you understand that the sodomite transgendered movement, pangendered, pansexual movement in this country is fed by the spirit of the androgynous antichrist? It is being spurred on because I believe the anti... In fact, turn to uh, Revelation 9. I'll show it to you. I'll show you. I'll read to you what I believe. This Bible's right. This Bible uncovers all of their dirty little secrets. When the bottomless pit is opened, there came out these locusts and they have power as scorpions. And I want you to notice what they look like. Verse 7, Revelation 9. The shapes of the locusts were like unto horses prepared into battle. And on their heads was, as it were, crowns like gold. And their faces were as the faces of men. And they had the hair as the hair of women. They were multi-gendered. Androgynous. Andro means man. Gynus means female. They were in, and they had a king over them, verse 11, which is the angel of the bottomless pit, which is Abaddon and Apollyon. That's the Antichrist. He is the, and all throughout mythology, there is the androgynous God who is both male and female. Bacchus, Dionysus, Shiva of the Hindu uh, religion is androgynous. He is male and female combined in the same body. That is the God of witchcraft, and that is the God that Kenneth Copeland believes in, and all that other lot. And Rick Warren, too. Uh, here's another principle of Wicca. We believe in the affirmation and fulfillment of life and a continuation of evolution and development of consciousness, giving meaning to the universe we know and, per and our personal role within it. They teach evolution. And let me tell you what evolution is all about. Evolution is less about where we came from and all about where man is going. And because evolution now, since Darwin, has pervaded into every college, every school, most of the major religions in the world, including Bible colleges and seminaries, they no longer teach the literal interpretation of Genesis 1. They teach it as symbolic and they have included 13 billion years of creation down into the creation week. And they, they, it's called theistic evolution. And they believe a form of that that makes them look spiritual. They say that Adam was not the first man, but he was the first man that God made the covenant with. But see, that's a lie. Because the Bible says... By one man, sin entered into the world, and death by sin. 
So if you believe that Adam was not the first man, then you believe that every man, if you're going to stick with the Bible, that every human being that came before Adam had not died until Adam sinned. Then they all started, then they all died. Because death was not introduced into the world until Adam sinned. That is very clear. And I mean death of every creature, every insect, every animal, and mankind itself. Death was introduced when Adam sinned. The Bible's very clear on that. So, they, but the evolution then is about where man is going. There is a transformation coming. The transformation of the righteous is the rapture. You and I are going to be translated, this body, gone! Your backache, gone! Your pacemaker, the expiration date. Your body done with, God transforms us, new bodies, we're resurrected. I absolutely believe that along at that time, every man, woman, and child in this world is also going to have a similar transformation, but it is a transformation to death. Evolution is about changing man's genetics, melding technology into the human soul. Those things are coming. And man has said, since we now have the keys and the tools and the technology, we're not going to wait a million years for our next step of evolution. We're going to bring it to ourselves and change ourselves. And that transformation is already happening. There are already people who are having their DNA edited. There are already experiments going on with melding technology into the human mind. It's coming. You have, then you have churches called the Evolved Church. Evolved church, small groups. The symbols are important here. I don't, I don't have time to get into all the symbols. The shift church. That's a reference to a new age term called the paradigm shift. A paradigm shift is, let's say that, uh, let's say that Joe Huddleston doesn't believe in UFOs, doesn't really care, thinks nothing of it, and then one lands in his yard. And he sees it with his own eyes. And these little creatures come out, take one look at him, get back in the ship and take off. Joe doesn't not believe in UFOs anymore. Okay? He, believe, he saw it. That's a paradigm shift. When something changes the way you think, about this world and this universe, that's a paradigm shift. God, here's what God calls it. Turn to Second Thessalonians. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep talking until that bell rings. I've spent a lifetime studying stuff like this. My sister will tell you. I'm the one reading books about UFOs and Bigfoots and Loch Ness Monsters and I still do it. <laughs> I'm still doing it. Let me tell you what the let me tell you what the paradigm shift really is. Second Thessalonians chapter two, verse seven, for the mystery of iniquity doth already work. See, it's already in progress, isn't it? The mystery of iniquity and the work of the spirit of the Antichrist is already moving. You're going to see it in the watchman broadcast that I'm going to release today. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. When the wicked is revealed, that's the paradigm shift. People are going to believe. Atheists are going to believe. Verse 9. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. Let me tell you about J. Allen Hynek. J. Allen Hynek was the man. He was a physicist and a professor and a scholar. And he did not believe in UFOs. So the UFO, the Air Force hired him to manage Project Blue Book. Because he was a skeptic, 
they said, we'll count on him to whitewash all UFO accounts. And that's what he did. But when the Air Force closed it down, J. Allen Hynek, the esteemed professor who did not believe in UFOs before that project, went lecturing everywhere until the day he died and said, they're real. I know they're real. I helped cover it up. He had a shift in his consciousness to where he knew that he, he, he knew that he was covering it up and he knew he was lying to everybody. So watch this. Verse 10. With all deceivableness of unrighteousness and them that perish because they received not the love of the truth that they might be saved. You know what the truth is? You're holding it in your lap. Do you love that truth? Do you love it? God will protect you. God will shield you with that truth. He will put his wings over you and say, you, t tell the devils, you cannot touch them. And they will not approach because they're scared to death of God, aren't they? So verse 11, for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. That's what the paradigm shift is. It is the strong delusion. It is the lie that is going to be told to this world. And everybody, everybody you know is going to believe it. Except you. If you love this truth more than anything. I do not ask anybody in my church to believe in UFOs. I do not ask you to believe in Bigfoot. I do not demand that you must believe in, okay? Because some of you, it doesn't matter. And I'm okay with that. But get ready. For a big lie to come to this earth. And you hold on to this. And say, I don't believe it. I believe this. Amen? How many days does it take God to create everything? Six days. You hang on to that. You hang on to it. Father in heaven, I love you. And God, you, you know, Lord, the draw. That some of this stuff has been to me in my life. You know the devils wanted to get a hold of me. And have me believe lies. And God. You had the right. To turn me over. To a reprobate mind. With all of us. You had the right to. But you didn't do it. You chose God. To anchor us. Loving the truth of the word of God. And Father, there's a lot out there in this world. It's all bad. It's corrupt. Very corrupt. God, save us from the corruption and the lies. And don't let us believe them. Shield us and cover us with your truth, we pray in Jesus' name. All of God's people said, Amen. Amen.